imagine if you're a trucking company and your your expenses were that high. You you'd never book a load of freight. And so insurance makes up third, fourth, or fifth total for third, if you take total cost of risk, third, fourth, or fifth largest expense of most motor carriers. So you're looking for a way to finance that cost lower to lower your own OR, right? So you can't, the, we don't want insurance company expenses put on our operating ratio if we can avoid it. Capt is used to have cheaper expenses. Today, they generally don't. Trucking is difficult. It's an essential industry that every corner of the nation depends on, even without knowing it. To the average consumer, the supply chain is magic and sometimes a black hole. Products on store shelves, dinner on restaurant tables, packages on doorsteps. It's expected to be there on time, every time, and only recognized if there's a service failure. But how is a sausage made? Who's talking about the issues that matter to trucking companies? Welcome to True North Truck Thought, or the Triple T Pod for short. A monthly podcast hosted by Scopolitas Transportation Consulting and brought to you by True North Companies. We're here to demystify the magic address the black holes, and to talk trucking to the industry we love. Whether it's the latest research, upcoming laws and rules, safety issues and solutions, or practical discussions about real-life supply chain challenges, the Triple T Pod is here to help the most important industry in our country to navigate its greatest challenges and opportunities. We bring together some of the best and brightest experts to talk about and tackle some of the most pressing industry issues. So without further ado, I'm Steve Kepler. And I'm Sean Garney. Let's get trucking. Hello and welcome to the latest installment of the Triple T Pod, brought to you by True North Companies and hosted by Scopolitas Transportation Consulting. Over the last several years, the business environment in trucking has been challenging, to say the very least. Companies have been dealing with labor shortages, high inflation, unpredictable freight rates, a difficult litigation landscape, and on top of all that, stubbornly high crash rates. All of these impact their ability to secure favorable insurance rates. To combat this, motor carriers are looking for innovative insurance solutions to remain competitive. This has led to insurance experts like Dan Cook, today's guest, to fielding questions about whether a captive can help carriers take more control over their risk profile while gaining greater financial flexibility and protection. And so, today, we're pleased to host this conversation designed to help carriers answer one critical question. Is a captive the right solution for me? Joining us today is Dan Cook, Principal and Practice Leader for True North Companies. Located in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Dan specializes in risk financing strategies. He comes to the conversation with over 30 years of experience in insurance, having held executive positions with insurance companies, agencies, and a national broker. Dan is an avid student of insurance and finance and is deeply involved in the operational aspects of his clients' businesses. So welcome to the podcast, Dan. Appreciate you being here. Hello, Sean. Appreciate you and Steve having me today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, One thing I'm appreciating now is uh, preseason football. I don't know if that's on your radar at all, but my Buffalo Bills are looking to drive towards the Super Bowl and then, you know, jump off the highway right before the the entrance ramp. So I don't know (laughs) if that's the same for you guys. Well, we'll see about that. The Baltimore Ravens may have something to say about that. So, (laughs) True story. Finally, finally, for maybe the first time in my life, people are saying positive things about the Detroit Lions. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. (laughs) Well, wait till Thanksgiving. (laughs) And then we'll we'll know for sure. So good. Well, uh, thanks again for being with us uh, today, Dan. I think captive insurance – is something a lot of people are interested in, but just don't know an awful lot about, uh, myself included. So um, I'm going to toss it over to Steve here to fire the first question at you, but I'm um, really looking forward to the conversation today. So thanks, Sean. And, and Dan, thanks again for joining us today. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been an interesting uh, situation in the last few years with the industry and rise of nuclear verdicts and litigation and lots of cost challenges for carriers and and we appreciate you bringing your your insight here to help carriers in their their path forward um to get started maybe if you don't mind just giving us a a little bit a lay of the land if you will with the insurance market and the trucking industry over the last couple of years yeah 
an interesting couple of years of the very polite way of saying it's been a really <laughs> crappy market. For, oh, oh, oh. For <laughs> truth is spoken by Dan. <laughs> <Cook>. <laughs> and, 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 fortu- and, and fortunately, there, it, it's, it's a little better today. I, I, I think if we back up a bit, you know, we, we like other industries, uh, you know, had a real capacity crisis where, the, uh, the insurance availability really restricted and, and rates went up. We saw a particularly difficult excess market where companies, you know, were unable at, at any price, a number of the larger fleets to get the level of excess protection that they really had, they had previously carried or they felt they needed to protect the, the balance sheets of the business and the jobs that they have created over the years. Um, gradually, we've seen the market calm down uh, and we've seen some new capacity whether that's capital flowing into the reinsurance industry or into the primary insurance companies or whether that's new entrants new insurance companies or underwriting facilities start to open up i am not professing it's good but i will tell you it's it's better and it's a it's a more rational more stable market today than we've seen in the past um, we're not in the we're not in crisis mode anymore. So I, I do want to get to captives, but of course I'm captivated by this. Let's see how many captive uh, puns I can throw in during this podcast. Uh, I'm captivated by this, uh, the, the ebb and flow of this insurance market. And when times were really tough and it was really hard to get insurance, is that because there were fewer underwriters, fewer agents? What happened in the insurance market to just make it so difficult for carriers to find the insurance they needed? Well, certainly there aren't fewer agents. You, know, you, you can find an insurance <laughs> under every rock you turn over. Uh, but but uh, there, were, there were fewer markets or markets that were around had less capacity to take risk. A lot of it's the function of, of the reinsurance industry. Uh, you know, just like small businesses buy insurance and they pool that all together to spread the individual risk to any one business insurance companies then buy reinsurance where they're taking parts of the risk whether that's on an individual claim whether it's on a line of business or over their whole portfolio of risk and they're selling it off to larger aggregators who are reinsurance companies who are spreading that risk in most cases now globally across many different areas of business and personal finance, the reinsurance industry has got their clock clean financially. They live in a very, very low interest rate environment for a long time. So, you know, we give money to the insurance company, they get to hold that money and, and relatively conservatively invest those dollars, knowing that in the future, at some point, they're going to pay a lot of those dollars out in claims, but in the interim, they earn investment income, and that is a big part of the profit margin that insurance companies secure. In and so real- then, when the market crashes, they've got less they've got less money to write underwrite risk. That's that- right. So when the stock market goes down, their balance sheet, their asset basis goes down, and when interest rates are super low, their earnings are down. And so you know, you, and then you throw on top of it wars and cat. cat, cat you know, a lot of catastrophic loss, whether that's hail or hurricane or fire in California. And the insurance industry has performed really, really poorly over the last several years. Then you look more isolated. You drill into what areas are they making money and what areas are they losing money? And for the last 13 years in total, U.S. commercial auto liability has lost money. We've averaged about a 110% loss ratio. So for every dollar we give the insurance industry, they've paid out about a dollar ten in claims. And even with the math of magic that they're so good at, <laughs> math of magic, the interest the interest they earn on our dollars it hasn't been enough. Well, well let's. I think that first of all, thanks for sharing that perspective because I yeah. think a lot of people think that. You they're know, just angry at insurance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got to. They're increasing the rates. They're got to be making tons of money, and mm-hmm. and, uh, and and I think you're well to point out. We've you know certainly uh, we've had lots of catastrophic losses of all different shapes and sizes, and I, I 
that the, a lot of those things very, you can't really predict that stuff. So, um, well, I appreciate that. That's great, great background, I think, and puts perspective um, for a lot of people because you guys are a business just like everybody else, and it's important. Um, and you, you, you serve a very important um, purpose in in the market. So, so maybe let's let's change, switch gears a little bit and talk um, more specifically about captives. That's probably the tenth time we've said it. Um, so, so maybe talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what is, explain a little bit about what's an insurance captive. Yeah. And, and captive is a really big bucket. And, uh, and unfortunately we tend to throw that term around pretty loosely and, and, and defining it matters. So, you know, they're in, in the transportation industry and I'll try to be more specific to our business. Um, there are, a few trucking companies or large logistics organizations that have single parent captives, meaning they've gone through a feasibility process, they've gone through financial and tax studies, and they've determined that they have the scale, the spread of risk, and the financial capacity to own and operate their own insurance company. And we've helped here at True North form a number of those businesses and, and oversee the management of them. But it takes real scale and real spread of risk um, to be able to effectively and efficiently utilize a single, you know, to own your own insurance company as one of your opcos. That's a big step, right? So that's not an option for most of the motor carriers that are going to hear this podcast or operate in our industry. Most motor carriers, when you talk about is a captive correct for them, it means should they jo join a group of other motor carriers in a commonly owned smaller insurance company. And, and those oftentimes are formed by an agency like True North. We have, we have our own captive insurance facility domiciled in Arizona that we use for a variety of purposes. And a number of agencies have those. And so each of those captives which is a group of trucking companies and one insurance company. That's really what it is. It's a small insurance company. It's a tiny version of Great West or Northland or Travelers or whoever it is. I call it a small risk pool. So I just got done telling you guys that writing auto liability insurance in the United States for insurance companies has been a losing proposition for now over the last 12 or 13 years. So if a trucking company is going to join a group captive and become an owner in an insurance company and write auto liability, you got to think about, is that a good business decision, not just a good decision as to how I'm going to finance my risk, right? It's challenging. You're just moving from the big professionally managed risk pool of protective insurance company or great West to now a smaller managed risk pool of you and your friends. And sometimes that works better. And sometimes it works meaningfully worse. And one of the things that I know about risk pools, having done this for 33 years now, and, and guys, I have looked at, I've helped hundreds of companies evaluate, should they join a captive? And I've helped dozens get out of captives because it no longer fit their needs. And I will tell you one thing I know about risk pools of all sizes. They all move to the average. They move to the mean. The very best companies in every industry can generally negotiate a better deal, a better above market deal on their own than the, than the pool can. And the very worst members of every captive or every risk pool try to stay in as long as they possibly can because they're going to get creamed if they go out in the commercial marketplace. And so pools as they age move to the average. And so you're not, it's really more about how the, the motor carrier performs, how strong are they in mitigating and managing risk than the underwriting facility they choose to join. So, so that's, it's interesting. So, so it really, you're betting on yourself. Right. And your friends. And and you've got I to tell you it. what, you don't know my friends, but I ain't betting on them. <laughs> no way. So 
so in that in that model, um, so maybe talk a little bit more how the risk is managed a little bit and who bears that risk. Yeah, you know there are a couple um, within the group captive space. There's different types of group captives. There's group captives that are formed and operated by professional captive managers. A um, couple of, you know, largest in our industry are captive resources and hard tax. There's others. There's also captives that are set up and, and managed by agencies. Um, and then there are some captives that are set up and operated by insurance companies for trucking companies where those insurance companies are have may have some risk in the captive along with the members, but they also get to do make the underwriting fees and the investment in fees and the and the policy issuance and services fees. So there's real different groups of buckets of group captives. There's also a, a distinction between heterogeneous and homogeneous. For our purposes today, we're largely talking about group captives that only insure trucking companies. However, there, there are more group captives in America that, in, that are heterogeneous. So they'll have some manufacturing, some construction, some retail, some various things. As a way to spread risk, kind of, right? You can Yeah, and they tend to be lower risk. And so heterogeneous group captives generally have lower reinsurance costs. It's less expensive to handle claims for those type of companies than it is a trucking accident. So the operating cost of heterogeneous captives is generally lower than a homogeneous trucking insurance captive. Hmm. That's about the most expensive group captive you can operate. So there are a few trucking companies, I can think of probably 20 in the U.S., that are in heterogeneous captives that got in years ago. You almost, if you're a trucking company today, you can't get in one, almost virtually. Those that are in, they need to stay there because if they ever leave it, they're never going to find cheaper insurance. The rest of us are looking at joining homogeneous group captives, the rest of the motor carriers. So then you got to evaluate, you know, the operate, the, the cost of operating that insurance vehicle versus What's the overhead of uh, that's built into the premium that Protective might give you or DMC or Carolina Casualty, pick your insurance company, and the various different structures that they all offer. So, cap, like I said, captive is this big generic term, but for our purposes, it's a group of trucking companies that are in a jointly operated insurance company that just serves the interest of trucking companies. And is that then the biggest benefit of joining a captive is the delta between what my protective insurance provider would charge me from a premium, premium, maybe deductible, but probably premium space and what I, what I pay in a captive? Is that, is that the biggest financial benefit? Are there others? It, it used, hey, oftentimes that's not a benefit even. I, it, it used to be when I got in this business and I worked with some of the initial group captives 30 years ago and, and the operating cost of the captive was much lower than the operating ratios of the insurance industry in general. And that's completely changed. Um, operating costs of what I'll say is professionally managed group captives. These are managed by captive management companies that do not sell insurance. They're not retail agents or brokers. Their operating costs generally are about the same as the operating expenses of DMC Protective Great West. Everyone's in that 29 to 33 points. So if you give an insurance company a dollar a premium, they're going to eat up the first 32 cents on average with the blimp, with the corporate headquarters, with their advertising budget, their expenses, their computer systems. Agents. What percentage is the blimp, do you think? I know. <laughs> just, I've, I'm kind of trying to dabble in the blimp market, so I just want to. <laughs> uh, they, don't, they don't generally disclose that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, then you can go to any football game you want, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. right. But, but their operating expenses are about 
Yeah. Imagine if you're a trucking company and your your expenses were that high. You you'd never book a load of freight. And so insurance makes up third, fourth, or fifth total for third, if you take total cost of risk, third, fourth, or fifth largest expense of most motor carriers. So you're looking for a way to finance that cost lower to lower your own OR, right? So you can't, the, we don't want insurance company expenses put on our operating ratio if we can avoid it. Captives used to have cheaper expenses. Today, they generally don't. In fact, many agency owned and operated um, captives have higher expenses than a lot of the insurance companies do. So you're hoping by being in a like group, you share risk management and claims best practices, and you get better at safety, you get better at handling claims, you reduce those costs. You also, when you join a group captive, your portion of the premium gets put in that investment fund and you as a captive member get most of that investment income, which you're not getting if you give your money to an insurance company. So investment income is a source. Also a portion of the premium dollars you pay into your captive is available to be returned to the motor carrier if it goes unused. So it's really the investment income and some unearned premium down the road years from now might come back to the motor carrier. So you have to really think about the net present value of the potential not guaranteed return of premium in the future. The other, the other big consideration that oftentimes isn't considered enough is the way you have to collateralize a group captive. Many of the modeling scenarios that we do for motor carriers show that the amount of collateral that has to be posted over the first four years of membership of a group captive to be greater than a number of other alternatives that the motor carrier could have got in the insurance marketplace, the traditional insurance marketplace. And so as you post letters of credit or, you know, whatever collateral you're giving to your now your insurance company that you're part owner in, you're eroding your borrowing basis. It's offsetting your ability to, to grow your fleet, to run your CapEx program. You know, so collaterals are really consideration and generally captives don't win on the collateral argument, but it's yeah. consideration. Now, and that, that I think that's a really good point because a, pop, a lot of folks probably don't consider that. Um, as they're making these decisions. So are there any tax benefits or incentives from, from captives? Uh, that, is there any benefit there? That there, there, there is in the, there's something called an 831B micro captive. It's under tremendous scrutiny and litigation uh, with the IRS. Very few motor carriers find a use for the 831B IRS tax election. We're talking about 831A. 831A is single parent, whether that's the, the group's organization or one owned by an individual motor carrier. Um, very little tax benefit is the way I should couch it. When I got in the business, a lot of people were domiciling their captives in the Cayman Islands or in Bermuda or Guernsey or somewhere. And a number of large corporations were not declaring that income on their U.S. taxes. The IRS was very successful 25, 30 years ago um, in litigation against some prominent American corporations. Virtually everyone today and all of the truck insurance agency owned captives that I'm aware of, all those members take the U.S. tax election and treat it as ordinary income tax. So the benefit is has largely gone away. Got it. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned benefits. I want to move into the benefits of a captive. Um, who should, so with all these risks and all of this capital costs, right? And and the fact that I'm, I'm sure at least traditionally or, or long ago, captives were mostly targeted by pretty big companies, right? Um, 
that had big balance sheets that could that could you know spread risk or whatever. But I imagine that that pressure is sort of moving downstream a little bit. So who who should consider joining a captive? If I'm not a mega carrier, is that an option for me? Why yeah, or why not? It, it it really is. Uh, there are there are captives both captive manager form captives well and there's a couple insurance company group captives and there's a couple agency owned captives that cater to fleets down around 30 units every one of the important things to know is every captive has a different risk bearing structure so the le- the the limit of coverage they offer the deductibles that the member of that captive has to pay um, varies. I'm aware of group captives where the, the deductible per claim to the member is four, the minimum. They have one deductible for the captive and it's $400,000 per claim. Okay. I'm also aware of group captive where the deductible is $10,000 per claim. Whoa. And everything in between yeah. is out the marketplace. So one of the big, big mistakes that fleets make is they get a quote from only one captive and and they aren't considering they aren't going through a process away from the renewal cycle where they're learning about all the different captives what their different structures different deductibles they offer their size their financial strength who's in them and trying to find the captives that fit their risk appetite and their control position the way they manage risk as a business they're just taking whatever captive some agent has to knock on the door and says, here, I've got a captive you need to look at. And they don't, they don't know the difference. And why would they? They're not in this business, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they're, they're somebody in- told me I should join a captive. I'm in. <laughs> right. And you're being sold. I mean, the reality yeah, is sure. a professional is steering you towards the one they want you to be in for a variety of reasons. Sure. Yeah, sure. of course. Well, that's, that's interesting. So, you know, obviously, a lot of people when they're looking at insurance, they the first thing they look at is dollars and cents, right? What's the what's the money side of this? So, before a, a carrier wants is in considering whether to get into a captive or not, what are things like what are considerations that they need to think about themselves, um, to, whether it's a good fit for them or not? I'll say friendly, first and foremost, mm. because now are, the, are captive members generally safer than? The rest of the world? There's a loaded question. You don't have to answer. Well, I'll tell you what the reinsurers tell me. I, I'm I'm very much in touch with the reinsurers that reinsure the auto industry and reinsure the group captive space. The the performance of the pools aren't much difference different. Really? Um, I kind of thought that they would leverage each other's knowledge to create stronger safety programs and that there'd be peer pressure among captives to to drive safety programs. That's that's and, just and what I is. thought innately. And there is. And some of them are really, really good at it. Yeah. And some of them are very average at it. Um, some of the captives have done a great job of risk selection, meaning being careful about what members they let in and being disciplined about which ones they kick out. And some captives have not. They've put more emphasis on growth. And, and so... If you pool it all together in the muckety muck, captives don't perform appreciably differently than pr- the good underwriting insurance companies do. And their operating ratios aren't that different. Their reinsurance costs aren't that different necessarily. And their overall performance from a loss ratio standpoint. Now, there are some really good ones and there's some really bad ones, mm-hmm. but it tends to but it's on, I, I, I suspect that it, it's a lot like just safety in general, where, you know, the safety cult, the culture of that captive makes the difference into what as to whether they're going to be successful or not. I would think most members joining a captive are taking more risk than they were before they joined. You generally are moving from a, a deductible of some sort with an insurance company program over to a captive where you're taking a larger deductible oftentimes, and you're adding in physical damage and cargo and general liability 
where you may not have had deductibles before, the deductibles were lower. But when you move to the captive, you're taking more risk. So you've got more out-of-pocket exposure. So are, do you feel really good about your safety culture? Do you feel really good about your driver population? Have you actually been following your driver hiring standards or have you been do, getting away with as much as your insurance company would let you? Because now you're on the hook for part of these claims, right? So the very first thing you have to consider is, am I safe? What do I want to bet on myself? Secondarily, you got to consider who am I getting in with? Is that an above average group? I know these people. I'm in the trucking industry. Do they really have a culture of safety? Do I want to be in alongside them? You know, three, you got to do the math. You got to, and some of, some captives are not nearly as transparent during the recruiting process as we'd like them to see. And you're not seeing all the costs broken down or you're not exposed to maybe some future assessments that could come your way. A lot of captives are illustrating investment returns of five, six, seven percent um, that statutory investment requires in the insurance industry are much more stringent. Insurance companies, by and large, can't buy equities. It's a lot of really conservative investing. So the returns on your dollars oftentimes aren't as good as the performa might show, right? Yeah. And if you have claims, you're only going to earn investment income on premium you've paid in that doesn't get paid out in claims. Right. So if your claims experience isn't real good, there aren't going to be any investment income anyways. Right. <laughs> so you really got to understand all those nuances. Oh, it's a lot. What about, so we talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous, and I know that when you said heterogeneous, you were talking about um, sort of multiple industries coming together in a, in a captive. Uh, but as we know, like if we just look at trucking, like it's pretty heterogeneous from a, from a company to company standpoint, right? There's different segments, there's different types of equipment. And so do we see captives sort of collect around that? So another way to say is like, you might think flatbed or reefer has more cargo claims, right? Just because of the nature of their of their business or whatever. And so, would you or hazmat, ha, right? Hazmat. Yeah, or, or hazmat, right? So, do we do we see those captives collecting under around the type of operation that's happening? That's a great that's a great question, and, and I'd say it looks a lot like the insurance companies. There are insurance companies that specialize in hazmat, and that's pretty much all they do. There's an insurance company that kind of dominates the mid-sized large flatbed space. There's some insurance companies, though, that are just want best-in-class fleets from all the different trailer types or all the different segments. And, you know, if I think of a, you know, a, a Great West or a, a Protective or a, a Sentry, they tend to write all of it, right? Um, so captives are kind of the same way. There's, there's a captive that really specializes just in oil field services that they're writing trucking companies that are in the oil fields. There's captives. There's a captive that really likes the reefer business. Um, but most captives just want high quality fleets and are made up of some flatbed, some dry van, some reefer, some bulks, and a variety of different. There are a few that have limitations on hazmat, and that's that's not because the captive necessarily doesn't like it. It's because the reinsurance company so high up that exposure. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of captives are limited in what they can do, by how good a deal they have with their reinsurance company. Yeah, I can I can imagine. So so with all that said, who where should if a fleet you know want wants to consider this? Like who makes those determinations whether a fleet is a right fit? Who can who what would you suggest as advice for if a fleet wants to? There, consider this? There, there's a handful of agencies that will work with a motor carrier away from the renewal cycle to go through and evaluate and help to educate them on all the facilities. That's 90% of what we do in client acquisition happens, really starts a couple months after their most recent renewal and happens what I call off season where you're going through an educating, evaluating, and modeling 
on the ways in which a, a, a motor carrier might want to finance their business risk. You have to get to understand the motor carrier's hold position in their equity, meaning are, are they, will, might there be a sale in the near future in the next three to five years, internal or external? Because if you go into a captive or various forms of risk financing structures, you're going to post all this collateral. You're, you're going potentially to limit your transaction opportunities. If it's an internal sale, you might use up a lot of your borrowing basis that needs to be preserved for the next generation of managers and family members in order to transition equity within the business. So there's, there's a lot of things that need to be discussed when considering a captive or a risk retention group or a large deductible program, any of these risk financing vehicles, quite honestly, a lousy time to do it is when you're working on your insurance renewal. Mm. It's planning yeah. in the off season, all that modeling, all that evaluation, all that learning can happen in the off season. Then when you get into your renewal cycle, you've put together really a, an RFP structure. You said, okay, I understand all of them that are out there. Here are the few that fit me. Here's the basic deductible structure. Here's the format of the policy. Here's kind of, kind of what I know based on my business situation, my, my safety situation, my financial situation, our ownership structure. Here are the ones we want to look at in the renewal cycle. If you wait till the renewal cycle and you just send your information out, you're going to get a hodgepodge of all kinds of different things. You probably won't get as good a pricing. You'll get very distracted and you won't, you won't, you, uh, you won't look at all of probably even the opportunities that would have aligned well with you because you didn't find them. You didn't know they mm. were there. So, so question. So in general, with general insurance, I, I, it, it, you know, when the fleet gets the typical insurance, it is the policy is what it is. You just take it the way it's, it's designed and structured. But with captives, I, you fleet the involved those involved in the captives, they have a little bit more control over the policy itself, right? How does that? How does most that? Captives, mer- most captives, no, most captives have a defined structure. So it's this is the deductible. This is your A fund. This is your B fund. Here's how the collateral is calculated. It tends to be pretty clearly defined. It's just that there's a bunch of different trucking captives, everyone having their own structure. Mm. You've got to figure out which of those fits. Which you. fits. Yeah. When yeah. you're yeah. working with an underwriter, though, at a traditional insurance company, the underwriter can offer a variety of duct- deductibles, a variety of payment plans, a variety of different timing mechanisms from a liquidity standpoint, perhaps different collateral funding structures. So you have much more ability to customize your design in the traditional insurance market than you do in the captive. Here's the mistake a lot of fleets make. They put together what's called an underwriting submission. Here's my driver's list. Here's my equipment list. Here's my historical exposure. I had here for the last seven years, here was my revenue. Here were my miles. Here were my lanes. Here was the driver count. They give all that to an insurance company. So I, I started my career as an underwriter with St. Paul Travelers. I spent my first seven of the last 33 years as a large account underwriter. So I could, I could structure the program in a million ways to someday. What way do you think I would structure the deal, that, the quote that I offered to the, to the business? The way that was going to make me the most money. Right, 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 me as right. the underwriter was best protected. Right. The cash flow worked better for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't give you of all my options. I didn't go through and say, what's the one where I'm going to lose the most money or I'm going to have the least investment income. I was looking for an angle, right? Finding that balance between being competitive and maximizing my underwriting margin. Right. So motor carriers need to work with an advisor that's going to help them design the program. That's going to produce the, the lowest cost on a long-term sustainable basis while being sensitive to the way the organization competes internally for collateral capital and cash flow. What else is going on in the business? Where do we need our money? Where do we need our borrowing basis? That type of planning and design work can't happen when you're out bidding and quoting your insurance. 
everyone's trying to sell you their deal their way. So work there, there are, there are risk advisors. There's firms that just do that work for a fee. There are professional brokers that have built teams of people able to do that in the off season that are committed to our industry. Um, and fleets can, fleets can find those people like True North that, that they're comfortable with. But it's always my suggestion is do the hard work in the off season, not in the renewal season. Mm. So when does Garney Trucking call Dan Cook then? Like how far in advance do I got to call you to Honestly, start chatting about? When, when you're done with that renewal process. Just right away. Call. Yeah, call and just get to know us and see if we're a fit evaluate how we, you know, treat customers. What does our business process look like versus the broker they've dealt with for years or another broker that their friend recommended to them? Who seems to be the right fit? Understand those processes. Understand what, if any, costs are associated with that off-calendar work. Some firms like us will take a motor carrier through that process as an investment in the relationship and not charge for it. Now, we're, we won't do it randomly for anyone, but if we get to know them and think they're right fit, quality organization, similar values and character, then we'll engage in that process and we generally don't charge. Some charge a reasonable fee for the professional work. That Take the time to get to know people right after that renewal, because then you're going to want a few months to work with somebody, whoever it is you, you decide upon. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking about uh, my hypothetical fleet, Garney Trucking, um, and I've got 30 trucks. I'm listening to this podcast, and you just told me I could get in a captive. But I'm guessing not all 30 truck fleets make the cut. So what is, what's the most, distinction? Most is it about most capital? Most. Is it about safety record only? What is it about? No, those, those small captives tend to um, I want to be fair about this. Um, most of those 30 to 100 truck fleets are insured in the traditional market because they're able to get a better deal in the traditional market. Sure. And, and those, the smaller the deductibles in a group captive, the less the captive is really working the way it's intended because you don't have a lot of premium that's being set aside to earn investment income. You don't have a lot of skin in the game to offset claims and get premium back. They, they, don't, they don't generate the juice, right? And so a lot of these small, small fleets, the captives to me, I, so I've, yes, I said 30 trucks could get, there are a couple captives they can get into. They don't really start to make real sense to me to consider till you're closer to 100. And the sweet spot for group captives, at least my, what I view is probably in that 150 to 400 truck space. Cause you also can get too big. If you're a really well run, well financed trucking company, you get to a certain size and you can just get a better structure out in the conventional market in most cases. For every, for every 10, here's a good rule of thumb. And I've literally modeled hundreds in my career now. For every 10 businesses that I've modeled, would joining a group captive be the right option? I'm looking at large deductibles, risk retention groups, self-insured retentions. <clears throat> Two, it's generally an option we should consider. And only one of the 10 will ever join a captive. So I'm going through 10 feasibility processes and only one of those 10 in my personal experience ever ends up in a captive where it just, it was the, the right way for them to go. Um, so it's a, it's an arrow in our quiver. We, we do a lot of it, but it's just one of the many risk financing vehicles that are available to trucking companies today. Yeah. So I think, Kind of to, su to sum up, I, I get, you make a good point there. The, the key from the, the one, t the major takeaway I get from this conversation is, you know, number one, do your due diligence, do your homework, understand how it works, right? And, to, and, and talk to a trusted advisor that can help you in that path. Um, 
but but I think secondarily, given the given the way the market is, and particularly with the litigation world we live in, it's important for trucking companies to look at different options, right, and, and keep keep an open mind as to what makes the most sense for them um, in this particular in this environment right now. Would you say that to be true? That's absolutely true. And cap cap the captive insurance industry is growing. There are more and more companies that join captives every year. Now I've seen in 2023, a dip in interest. You know, when the market was really hard, rates were going up, you know, 25% a year. Everyone wanted to look at a captive, hoping that that was a solution, right? And we saw a number of people jump into captives out of desperation. I mean, they, they just couldn't absorb all that fixed cost. So they gambled on themselves. Now, with the stability we talked about in the market, I just renewed a, a 500 truck fleet here this week where we had a 2% rate increase. It was just pretty steady. Wow. They just, you know, yeah, it's good. And so there's no incentive. They weren't even interested in looking at right. capital options. Like, Life is good right now. So, so some are, I mean, we're still seeing trucking companies join captives, but we're, we're in the hard market. Everyone wanted to look. Now that's waning a little bit, and it's just back to being one of the tools that we need to consider in the process. Um, awesome, Dan. This has been super interesting. Um, I have the same takeaway as Steve. As soon as Garney Trucking finishes the renewal process, I am calling my trusted advisor to figure out what the best mechanism is. I heard you mentioned risk retention groups. We'd love to have you back to talk about those one day, and there's all kinds of other vehicles out there that I think that are interesting. And we talked to a lot of carriers coming up on renewal and they're really just, you know, they come to us to say, Hey, I got to, you know, go up against my insurance company for renewal. And they haven't even laid the bricks to, to think about what all the options are out there. So uh, this has been super informative for me. I want to, of course, give everybody an opportunity for their final words um, last takeaways, but before that happens, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Can't wait to have you back. Thank you. I, I appreciate it, Steve. Great host. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I think being educated is the key from my perspective. And, and um, you know, and, and to me, another takeaway is, you know, if you're betting on yourself, you better make sure you've got a good culture and you've got you got a good handle on your operations and those friends you co you consider with being in a captive captive, you know, make sure you have a sense for what they're doing too. So um, very help, very helpful and very useful guidance here, Dan. We appreciate it very much. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure being, being with you today. Absolutely. So I, I'll, I'll take us out here. So, so thanks for listening to this episode of true North truck thought. If you enjoyed the topic today and want to tune in for future conversations here on the Triple T Pod, make sure to follow us. Also, please don't hesitate to let us know which topics you want us to cover in future episodes. Drop us a line in the comments section or send us an email to transportationnews at truenorthcompanies.com. Thanks and have a safe day.